and help me welcome Reverend John to the podium for his encouragement this morning. Thank you, Reverend Anne, and good morning, family. I just want to welcome you all and to welcome those who join us in consciousness on the World Wide Web and to tell you that my encouragement this morning is titled Good News, Good News. It was inspired by Sandra Cooper's wonderful talk at the, to the Press Association and uh, um, you heard it on the radio this morning. It was, it was replayed on RJR. Really wonderful, wonderful. So can you believe it's Christmas again? I have an a, a, a old, she's not old, but the friendship is, girlfriend. Um, she's Jewish, and she lives in London. And she doesn't take down her Christmas decorations from one year to the next. So I said, you know, you know Hannah, that's a little difficult because tinsel in August just doesn't work for me. Um, but she says, well, by the time you turn around, it's Christmas again. So I said, in any event, what are you as a Jew, a Jewish woman, celebrating Christmas? She said, well, I'm going to tell you a story. When I was at school, it was about Christmas time, and the teacher asked young Patrick Murphy, Patrick, what do you do in your family do at Christmas time? And he said, uh, well, Miss Jones, me and my 12 brothers and sisters go to midnight mass, and we sing hymns, then we come home very late and we put mince pies up by the back door and hang up our stockings. Then all excited, we go to bed uh, and wait for Father Christmas to come and bring us our toys. Very nice, Patrick, she said. Now, Jimmy Brown, what do you and your family do at Christmas? Well, Miss Jones, me and my sister also go to church with mom and dad and we sing carols and we get home ever so late and we put cookies and milk by the chimney and we hang up our stockings and we hardly sleep waiting for Santa to bring the toys. So the teacher had a little Jewish girl in the class, namely my friend Hannah. And not wanting her to feel left out, she said, and Hannah, does your family do anything at Christmas? And she said, yes, Miss Jones, um, we do something at Christmas. It's the same thing every year. Dad comes home from the office. We all pile into the Rolls Royce and drive to Dad's toy factory. When we get inside, we look at all the empty shelves and we sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. And then we all go to Jamaica for the holiday. <laughs> Everybody celebrates Christmas. So once again, we're entering a sacred season of celebration during which many people of differing religions and cultures honor the coming forth of the light for all humankind. It comes within our hearts and within our lives. Some people observe the winter solstice as the return of the sun in the darkest time of the year, and others light the menorah in honor of Hanukkah. And of course, those of the Christian faith retell the tender story of Christmas and of the star that appeared at the birth of a holy child, leading wise men to the discovery of the Christ. In recent years, African Americans have begun observing Kwanzaa, which begins, I think, on December 26th, and um, also involves the lighting of a candle on every night for seven nights. So a lot of cultures and religions and denominations celebrate the coming of the light and by the lighting of candles. And the light represents inspiration, illumination, truth, enlightenment, and the dawning of new hope for humankind. If ever there was a need for new hope for humankind, don't you think this is the time? Absolutely. The coming of the light, then, is truly good news. And there's a wonderful, um, a delightful carol titled Good News, set to music by our own maestro, Noel Dexter, which I hope we'll get to hear at our evening of sorrow and song on December 17th. Every year at Christmas, when I hear it and when I sing it, I am reminded of a little ragged boy who used to sell the Star newspaper on, at the corner of King and Harbor Streets in Kingston when I worked downtown Kingston many years ago in the 70s. And he was a little ragged boy, but he had two bright ackee seeds, you know, those bright, shining eyes. His eyes looked like the, the firmament that the newspaper was named after. And he would stand there, barefooted, rain or shine, saying, Sty, Sty, get your star. 
had an encounter with him one Christmas which was really amazing. The newspaper, um, which was not known to be a herald of good news, um, had carried a story about one of my co-workers. Um, uh, she featured in a, a rather spectacular and, um, well, let, us put it, let me put it this way, scurrilous account of a divorce with a prominent businessman. And she was really hurting. But we used to walk out on King, St on King Street, Harbour Street and King Street all the time. There are some people here who used to be in that promenade downtown. And um, as we approached him, she said, me, I don't buy the star again, you know, <laughs> from what them to me two weeks ago. Because, I mean, there were, you know, great details of this, this um, divorce case. But when we approached him, uh, he didn't look his usual bright, bubbly self. You know, he, he was kind of subdued. And she herself said to him, what happened to you? You don't look so bright today. And he said, I know nothing, ma'am. Um, the star was very late um, today. And my mother not well, and she was at home. And I was just best asking God, do father, make me sell off the star them quick so I can go home and make her something to eat. And you know, there followed that awkward silence. You know, when you're faced with somebody's pain and you don't know what to say, never happened to you? And you, you think, how do I handle this? So a couple of people mumbled, all right, I hope your mother soon feel well. And one or two of us bought stars for people back in the office or for ourselves. Not my friend though, because you know, she was in an umbrage over the story about her. And off we went back to office. End of story, part one. About 10 minutes after I was back at my desk, she said to me, John, I'm going for the car. Meet me on Harbor Street. So I said, no, I will just come back off the street. Where, where are you going? But you know how it is with good friends? Sometimes they say, follow me. And you, if you love them, you just follow them. She said, don't ask me a question. Just follow me. So I met her back down on Harbor Street. And she picked me up in the car. And she drove back to the intersection where that little boy was standing. And she said to him, how much star you have leave? So I thought, strange. And he said, he, I don't remember what he said, but he, he hadn't been there very long so the, because the star had been late. So he had a pile, a stack on the, on, the, on the road beside him on the sidewalk. And she said, put them in the trunk. And he said, all of them? And she said, all of them. And she said, how much may I have for you? Now there had to be some mathematics. Because now, you know, this is major multiplication. And she paid him in full for all the stars and locked the trunk. And I thought to myself, Christmas really makes miracles in people's hearts and in people's lives and brings out the best in them. I said, well, you said you don't buy a star again, so what are you going to do with them? She said, I'm going to give them to the JSPCA. They always need. <laughs> Newspapers for the dog, Deb. <laughs> My friends, Christmas makes miracles in human hearts. Or as Khalil Gibran says, love, if it finds you worthy, directs your course. And so I just wanted to share that story with you because it was a, a moment of transformation. And I want you to know that one of the regrets of my life is that I never knew that little boy's name. I never found out his name because every Christmas when I hear good news, good news, and people talk about hang the star on the highest bough of the tree or um, you know, the carols come, I remember him and, and I tear up for that. I'm certain he grew up to be a fine Jamaican. Um, I hope he didn't go into politics, but if he did, um, he, he would have still been wonderful. So friends, we call those moments Kodak moments, you know, when the days when you had Kodak cameras. Anybody remember those, those days? <laughs> and if you saw his face, his face looked like how those shepherd boys must have looked when they, they said the, in the story they saw the angels. He was frightened. He was, he was disbelieving. He was overjoyed. Um, you know, it was just a range of emotions passing through uh, across his beautiful face. So historically, the good news of, Christ, of Christmas proclaimed by Christian preachers can be found in John chapter 3, verse 16. And I want to quote it for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
end of that quote. And this passage has been quoted as proof that Jesus had, was, had some special dispensation that he alone had and is not so this story ago. It is true that he was only begotten, meaning begotten only of God. And guess what? So are we. Begotten only of the one creator. And so you can with safety say, I am begotten only of God. Can we say that together? I am begotten only of God. So only begotten refers to spiritual man, the principle of divinity in all humans, which is the Christ principle. The only begotten means that which is begotten only of God. I want you just to remember that. You are begotten only of God. Nothing else could make you. And if God is good, then you must be good and very good. No matter what your circumstances are at the present moment, no matter what you are facing, no matter what the diagnosis, no matter what the circumstances, you are begotten only of something that only can produce perfection and wholeness and holiness and beauty and good. But friends, the good news in John 3.16 is that God's love is so great, his wisdom so infinite, that he has given unto each of us that which is pure and perfect and which is begotten only of him. So no matter what a person may experience, as I just said, it's, I just want you to hold on to the, the thought that I am begotten only of God and God could only beget what is good. Now I know that we understand this. Um, intellectually. You know, St. Paul said, um, Christ in you, the hope of glory, in Colossians um, 1, verse 27. And Jesus bid us to follow his example by taking the Christ way to fulfillment, so that we too may live in the knowledge that life is truly ongoing and everlasting. Life is everlasting because God would not create something that just withered away and died. So life is forever, it's continuous, and it is forever and ever unfolding. Now, it's easy to, um, to grasp that, and you know, you know it up here a lot. We know that life is everlasting. But if you have lost a loved one during the past year or so, particularly if this is your first Christmas without them, uh, you may experience periods of deep sadness, and in fact, dark moments that not all the lights on the Christmas trees can brighten for you. And guess what happened? It's okay. It's okay to be sad, and it's okay to miss the ones you love. And I'm going to give you an assignment that will help you to work on that. They may have made their transition, or you may have ended a relationship, or you may have left a job. Um, th there are many forms of separation. And or any of them can make you feel a pang of, of sadness and, and, and darkness and despair. But there is a way to handle it. And the way to handle it is not to fight it and not to say, no, I shouldn't be feeling this. Um, allow yourself to feel it because it's part of the whole human side of you, which is linked to the divine side of you. And I'll give you that uh, assignment um, in a little while. The other assignment I have for you is, is for everybody. Um, and it's a simple one, and it's what I learned from that little boy on the corner of Harbor and King Street. Learn the name of the people that serve you. Simple assignment. You're at lunch over the Christmas period or at dinner. Ask your waiter or waitress and the bus boy their name and use it when you're asking for another glass of wine, or please take the steak back and, and, and make it, uh, do it a little more in the oven, call them by name, you will be amazed at the reaction you get. Now, I walk in the mornings, uh, well, let me say, I used to walk in the mornings <laughs> regularly, and there are a group of people who sweep Devon Road. And one morning he stopped and I said, you know, you look after the road so nicely every morning, what is your name? And the, if it's a lady, she said, who? I said, what is your name? My name is John. What is your name? She said, my name? I said, yes. 
what your mama name you? What your papa name you? What I call you? And she told me, and she said, you really ask me name? I said, but you, you look after Devon Road so beautifully every morning and we pass and we say, howdy, you never know my name, I never know your name, we'll be no more strange. Well, she actually grew about two inches. She straightened up, you know, and you would have thought that it was Davina <laughs> on the Miss Universe stage. You know, she kind of fixed the hair and, you know, and I thought, just ask somebody's name. Ask the name of the, the garbage man or the foreman on the garbage truck. Ask the name of the security guard at your office complex. Um, hello. Ask the name of the people who you sit down with in a this sanctuary <laughs> and see Sunday after Sunday and you say hello and you don't know what them name. Find out the name of the person and when you come to our Christmas concert on the 17th of December, find out the names of the people that you are enjoying Mr. Dexter's glorious music with and Mr. Harold Davis's beautiful um, compositions and renditions. Let us start to call each other by name. Is that a, a doable assignment? Yes. Wonderful. The second assignment can be undertaken too because as I said, all of us have separations of one kind or another, not just when people have made their transition. And this, but this exercise is especially useful for those whose grief is still recent. When the sadness or loneliness or that empty feeling grips you, you know, that kind of emptiness that grips you, take a moment to practice what I call heart breathing. I'll tell you how to do heart breathing, it's very simple. Simply imagine a warm breeze entering your heart each time you breathe in. Just put your hand on your heart for a moment. It's on the left side, by the way, for ushers. The ushers will place a sticker over your heart. No, it's on the left side near the center. <laughs> um, when you breathe in, just think the person's name as you breathe in and imagine him or her in a beautiful situation with you. And then as you breathe, remember, and the, by the way, the memory doesn't have to be a serious and mushy one. When I think of my, my Daisy, my mom, I, I, I think of how outrageous she was. I remember all the ribald, dirty, very risky jokes she used to tell right around the background there. Uh, and then Reverend Emma would say, Daisy, dear. <laughs> you know, and I knew it was rudeness being, t being whispered to the person beside her. So it doesn't have to be a serious or, or mushy thought. It can be a, a hilarious memory. Just breathe in and say their name and say in your mind, your love is a treasured gift. Thank you. Your love is a treasured gift. Thank you. And that will just, just be a moment of honoring them in that heart breathing exercise. Because friends like Jesus, we need to discover and behold and look for the divinity that everybody we encounter on life's pathway, um, that we encounter on life's pathway. Nobody is there by accident. There are no chance meetings. I don't believe I booked up that little boy to learn that lesson in the 70s that I've carried all my life with me. So people come in for a moment or for a period but there are no accidents. They are there for a reason. Um, there's a story by an unknown author that underscores this truth that we are all connected and we all meet for a reason. And I want to share it with you. One day, a poor boy was selling goods from door to door to pay his way through school. And he found he had only one thin dime left and he was hungry. He decided he would ask for a meal at the next house. However, he lost his nerve when a lovely young woman opened the door. How many of us does that happen to? Instead of a meal, he asked for a drink of water. She thought he looked hungry, so brought him a large glass of milk. He drank it slowly and then asked, how much do I owe you? The one dime I'm having. You don't owe me anything, she replied. Mother has taught us never to accept a pay, pay for kindness. He said, then I thank you from my heart. 
As Howard Kelly left that house, he not only felt stronger physically, but his faith in God and in humankind was strong also. He had been ready to give up and quit. Many years later, that same young woman became critically ill. The local doctors were baffled. They finally sent her to the big city where they called in specialists to study her rare disease. Dr. Howard Kelly was called in for the consultation. When he heard the name of the town she came from, a strange light filled his eyes. Immediately, he rose and went down the hall to the hospital, in the hospital to her room. Dressed in his doctor's gown, he went in to see her, and he recognized her at once after all those years. He went back to the consultation room, determined to do his best to save her life. And from that day, he gave special attention to her case. After a long struggle, the battle was won. Dr. Kelly requested the business office to pass the final bill to him for approval. He looked at it, then wrote something on the edge, and the bill was sent to her room. She feared to open it, for she was sure it would take the rest of her life to pay for it all. Finally, she looked, and something caught her attention on the side of the bill, and she read these words, paid in full with one glass of milk. Signed, Dr. Howard Kelly. So friends, the person sitting beside you or in front of you or behind you today is there by divine appointment. There are no mistakes. We are all meant to be here sharing this moment. And the good news is that when we are here for each other, the love that we share and the, 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 the regard for each other's divinity not just only just affects us and makes us feel good. The energy that we, we generate radiates from this center. It's called a center for a very good reason. Because the center is the hub, eh? And that love radiates out from the center to touch, to heal, to bless, to prosper, to love and liberate every single person that comes into contact with it. So please turn to your neighbor and say, Thank you for being part of my experience today. Namaste. Thank you for being part of my experience today. Oh, somebody just found out somebody's name. <laughs> Sparkle them. Very nice. Very nice indeed. And so, friends, my prayer for each of you this Christmas season is that deep knowing that the Christ indwelling is the law of your life. The Christ indwelling is the law of your life. Can you say that the Christ indwelling is the law of my life? The Christ indwelling is the law of my life. And by this law, by this divine principle, I am the purveyor of good news. By this law, by this principle, I am the purveyor of good news. We can accomplish it, friends. It, it only takes one question. You know, I've been seeing you here all of so long. What is your name? And those who say, I can't, I'm not good at names, write it down. <laughs> and the heart breathing, which we can do for all those we love, even if, they're not, even if they are on this plane of existence, but they're not here, they're abroad, family lives elsewhere. Just put your hand on your heart and heart breathe and say, thank you for the gift. Thank you for being in my life. Namaste.